Okay, so the plan for today is we're going to cover chapter 3. Wednesday's class and Friday's class is going to be in Lawrence 231. The reason for that is we are actually joining forces with the mathematical ecology class. We're going to be doing some applications of probability and coding to mathematical modeling. Yes? I'm sorry, Lawrence 231. This will be emailed. Okay. Now, you have no written homework this week for multiple reasons. This Friday is Winter Carnival. Homework is collected on Friday. There will be no written homework collected today. Eventually, I will post some additional problems for you to look at. You should be using this time to get your coding done really well, to be comfortable coding. I like Mathematica because that's what I was trained on. Whatever you want to use is absolutely fine. What I'm doing now, and I'll post it online, is I'm going through and I'm adding code to numerically explore a lot of the problems from the book. So for instance, there's a poker problem we're going to do today. There are two answers in the book. One is right, one is wrong. They differ by a factor of two. I wrote a little code to numerically approximate the probability and see which of the two logical derivations seems to be plausible. You want to get to the point where you can do this. If you can get to the point where you can program extremely well and efficiently, even better. But that's not the requirement for the class. The requirement for the class is to just write some very basic code, some very basic simulations. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to start talking a little bit about some of the basic functions. So this is basic functions of combinatorics. And I'm hoping most of you have seen most of these functions before, if not all of them. So the first is the factorial function. And it's defined n factorial is n, n minus 1, n minus 2, dot, 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 3 times 2 times 1, if n is a positive integer. 0 factorial, does anybody know what 0 factorial is? 1. And the meaning is the number of ways to order n objects when order matters. So imagine you have n people and you want to look at how many ways can I put them in a line. I have n choices for the first person, n minus 1 for the second, all the way down to 1 for the last. In problems like this, I like to view it almost as boxes. I have n choices for the first, n minus 1 for the second, all the way down to 1 for the last. <coughs> the biggest problem in issues like this and problems like this is figuring out when does order matter, when does order not matter. I may have already relayed Bush Sr.'s quote about you know, what is the purpose of the vice presidency, what is the job description. Anybody know this quote? You die, I fly. There's a difference between being vice president and being president. Okay? The two positions are not equal. When I was an undergraduate at Yale, we created the secretary to the math club. The secretary to the math club was held by a succession of pre-med students who wanted to inflate their CVs for applying to medical school. And they thought it would look really good to say that they were the secretary of the math club. Their job was to get pizza. Okay? It was not the same as the president. That was a position of true responsibility and power. Okay? <laughs> student government. Okay? Student government. Representatives are all basically the same. Okay? Executive board is different. Representatives are the same. So you always want to distinguish when does order matter, when does order not matter. Now if you're looking over here, we have zero factorial is one. Why would we choose to define 0 factorial to be 1? Well, let's think about the interpretation. n factorial is the number of ways to order n objects when order matters. <coughs> How many ways are there to order two people when order matters? Three people when order matters. One person. How many ways are there to order no people? One. There's one way to do nothing. Right? It would be absurd to talk about multiple ways of doing nothing. Right? You'd be doing something otherwise. All right, for people who want more, I'll put some links to Seinfeld later tonight. Okay? There's one way to do nothing. Okay? It is extremely useful to call zero factorial to be one. Another way to look at the factorial function is this is a recursive function. So n factorial is n <coughs> times n minus one factorial. And from a computational perspective, this is extremely nice. It allows us to get the next value immediately from the previous. We only need to go back one unit. 
On Wednesday, we will see more involved relationships where you need to go back more than just one step to determine the function. But what this allows us to do is we can march down. If we know the value of the factorial at one point, we know the next one immediately. Okay? Now, these numbers could be quite large, and in terms of you know, overflow and issues, there could be problems. Uh, the next thing is we are only dealing right now where n is a positive integer. Why? So why are we only looking at n a positive integer? Because there can't be negative objects. Yeah, we're not going to really talk about how many ways of it order negative five people or three-fifths of a person. Right? This does not make sense. You either have an object or you don't. You have a person or you don't. But of course, mathematicians, we don't like to just you know, confine ourselves to what might make sense. We like to take something like this and generalize. And later, we will see the gamma function. And I'll just state it right now. Gamma of s is the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus x, x to the s minus 1 dx. It turns out gamma of n plus 1 is n factorial if n is a positive integer. It is a nice generalization of the factorial function. This has incredible use. Why would this be useful? It's going to allow us to convert this function, which is defined only on the integers initially, to a function defined on the real numbers. And the idea is maybe we can use tools from what class? No, you've got to be a little bit higher than calculus, I'd say. Real analysis, right? So for those of you who've taken uh, Calc 3 with me, just say real analysis now instead of linear algebra, and you'll be right about 90% of the time. The techniques from real analysis, complex analysis, classes like that, allow us to say a lot of things about this function. And because we care about its values at the integers, if we can say things about this in general, then we can actually deduce things about integers. All right. The other thing is, in mathematics, you can define almost anything. The question is, what's a good thing to define? So this was the gamma function. So um, can someone tell me what 4 <laughs> factorial would be? 24. 5 factorial? 120. What do you think 5 double factorial would be? Okay, so by, by that I take it a big number. So what do you think 5 factorial might be? So you might think that this is 5 factorial factorial. You would be wrong because of convention. Could we define the double factorial like this? Absolutely. The question is, how often do we need to take the factorial of a factorial? And it turns out when you go through probability, this does not occur that often. A really useful definition is 5 times 3 times 1. What do you think the double factorial is? Every other. So double factorial, factorial is every other. And again, at this point in the game, we have no idea why this is going to be the useful definition of the double factorial. But it turns out in a lot of probability problems, every other occurs far more often than the factorial of a factorial. <coughs> so that is the one that gets the definition. Okay. But again, you always want to be thinking about what do I want to define, what's it going to be used for, is the notation going to be useful. Does this make sense as a notation for every other? I mean, we have two exclamation points from maybe it's a factorial, and because I have a two, that means every other. What do you think notation might be for every third? Three. Do you think that there is some danger of this notation? Hell yes. Right? This is extremely confusing. It could potentially mean the factorial of 5 factorial. If I write sine to the minus 1, what is sine to the minus 1 of x? So is it 1 over sine of x, or is it the inverse trig function, arc sine of x? This is why a lot of people write things like arc sine. Okay, I'm going to be hopping on this all semester. I apologize for those of you who don't care, but notation matters. You really want to think about the notation you're using to try to make it easy <coughs> to follow. Okay, 
So this is the notion for the factorial. This is when order matters. The next are the binomial coefficients. Okay? And so in the binomial coefficients, we're going to remove ordering. So in the factorial, we care about ordering. So we talked about if we have n people, there's n ways to arrange them. So how many ways to order 3 from n? So now if we only have, if we have n people still, but we only care about 3 of them, how many ways are there to order 3 from n? Not n choose 3. So I want to order three people, president, vice president, secretary. So the answer is n, n minus 1, n minus 2. I have n choices for the first, n minus 1 for the second, n minus 2 for the third. The only difference between this and the factorial is I'm not going all the way down to the end. I'm not choosing all people. I'm allowing myself not to exclude I'm allowing myself to exclude people. We are not creating fluff officerships so that everybody gets a position. Okay? For those of you who took a Lego winter study with me, everybody got some job title no matter how small. We, we made sure everybody had something. All right? In the real world, we're not going to go that deep. You are the 15th undersecretary administrative assistant to the, no, president, <laughs> vice president, secretary, treasurer, maybe a few more after that, but that's it n, n minus 1, n minus 2. This is not defined in terms of our factorial functions. But we can define it in terms of the factorial functions very easily. We use one of the most powerful techniques in mathematics. We multiply by 1. So there are two main things we can do. We can multiply by 1, and what's the other one? Add 0. And one of my professors at Yale, Peter Jones, paused one day and said the log of 1 is 0, so there's really only one thing we can do in mathematics. The whole point of doing this is to rewrite the algebra in a clearer way to highlight what's going on, to allow you to use previously defined quantities and methods. So now our answer is n, n minus 1, n minus 2. Let's multiply by n minus 3 factorial over n minus 3 factorial. We've just multiplied by 1. Have we changed the answer? No. The reason we do this is n, n minus 1, n minus 2. It's looking like a factorial. But it's not. It doesn't go all the way down. Well, let's have it go all the way down. We can't just have it go all the way down without changing the value in general. So what do we do? We then divide by what we multiplied by. And now we get n factorial over n minus 3 factorial. And some of you might remember this from your old high school days of NP3. You might have seen this button on calculators. This is the number of ways to choose three people from n when order matters. Okay? <coughs> One of the hardest problems is to then remove order. Well, if we want to remove order, this is the number of ways to choose three people from n when order matters. Once I have three people, how many ways can I arrange those three people? So how many ways can I arrange those three people? How many ways can I order those three people? Three factorial. I could have said six, but I don't like six nearly as much as three factorial. When I say three factorial, that reminds me where this number is coming from. It's coming from I have three people, I have three factorial ways of arranging them. So now what we're doing is we're getting to the binomial coefficients. How many ways to choose three from n, order doesn't matter. So it's going to be np3 divided by 3 factorial. And this becomes n factorial over n minus 3 factorial divided by 3 factorial. Nobody likes division on division. So we'll write this as n factorial over 3 factorial, n minus 3 factorial. If you think about it, if you look at all your sets of people, when I have three people, there are three factorial ways to order them. So conversely, if I look at the number of ways to choose three people when order doesn't matter, 
and I multiply that by 3 factorial, that should be the number of ways of taking 3 people when order matters. So number of ways choose 3 from n, order doesn't matter. If I take this and I multiply by the number of ways to order 3 people, this should be number of ways to choose 3 from n order matters. Okay? Is there anything special about 3? So instead of 3, this is the advantage of being on a blackboard, I can quickly replace 3 with k. All that happens is this becomes a k, 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 and one more, and this becomes a k. And now we get the number of ways to choose k people from n when order doesn't matter times the number of ways to order k people is the number of ways to choose k people from n when order matters. This allows us to then solve for the number of ways to choose k from n when order doesn't matter. And this is so important, we introduce some good notation for this. This is the binomial coefficients. You've hopefully seen these in Pascal's triangle. So binomial coefficient. n choose k, sometimes written n c k, is the number of ways to choose k from n, order doesn't matter. And we have a wonderful formula. n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. So if time permits later today, I will talk about some very interesting applications of this to Pascal's triangle and the difficulty of calculating these numbers quickly. My um, first few years after getting my PhD, I was a postdoc in many different places. I was hopping around the country trying to solve the two-body problem. At one point, I'm at The Ohio State University. I'm about to go to Brown, and I've been taught I'm going to be teaching mathematical, mathematical statistics, and this is the book I'm supposed to use. So I try to get a copy of it, and I get a you know, copy from the library at Ohio State, and there's a problem, and the solution to the problem is a binomial coefficient, and then the book continues, and you might think you've solved the problem, but you haven't. I'm going, no, I'm pretty sure I've solved the problem, this is the answer. And then I kept reading. You now have to compute the binomial coefficient. I'm going, well, what's the, oh, when was this book written? And so I had the second edition of the book, which was from like the 1950s. And back then, in terms of calculating quantities like this, it would overflow. If you've got a calculator or a phone, if you try to put in somewhere between 60 factorial and 100 factorial, your calculator or phone will typically blow up. You know, mathematics and stuff like that will handle. Just because I can write down something like this does not mean I can evaluate it well. When we go back and think about the birthday problem, look at all those multiplications, you often want to arrange the multiplications in good ways to be able to get something meaningful. So this is a point that's very easy to be missed in a pure math class. Just because we write something down does not mean that we have a useful form for the answer or for the solution. And so later today I will talk about how to efficiently calculate something like this if there's time. If not, I'll just post something in the additional comments. All right, but this is the binomial coefficient. So if I wanted to choose three people from five, uh, three from five, or if I was doing static, I should have done seven to nine, is five choose three, which would be five factorial over three factorial, two factorial, which when the dust settles is 10. Okay, there are an enormous number of properties you can prove about these binomial coefficients. And so, my first favorite one is the following lemma. n choose k is the same as n choose n minus k. There are a lot of different proofs. The most unenlightening is the one that I will not do in class. 
It's algebra. Write down what n choose k is from the definition. Write down what n choose n minus k is from the definition. And then just show that the two are equal. You know, if you cross multiply and play with the algebra, eventually they will turn out to be the same. There are some difficulties with this approach. One is, whenever you do algebra, it's dangerous. It's very likely to make algebra mistakes. Two, it sometimes is useful to have an idea of what you're trying to prove. And if you don't have the idea of what you're trying to prove, the algebra could be a little bit unclear as to how to go. I want to prove this by story. So proof by story. This is one of my favorite ways of proving things. Somebody tell me a story of what n choose k means. Give me a story where that's the answer. You're going to have kids someday, many of you. You've got to be able to tell stories. Yes? Uh, so you have, you have n dolphins. Okay. Wait, in k, in k, in one per pen in k pens, so I'm choosing k of them? Yeah. Uh, we have n dolphins, and we want k of them. And we don't care the order. Okay? And those dolphins, uh, anybody see any Free Willy? Neither have I, but I'm guessing that in Free Willy, Willy is eventually freed. <laughs> so these live. Okay. The other ones, unfortunately, the tuna industry, well, not everybody is as good as starfish, and some of them cannot claim that no dolphins were harmed. Uh, we have n dolphins. Dolphins want n minus k killed. These, not surprisingly, die. Okay. This is, I'm sorry? Yes, this is a brutal class. Oh, wait till uh, what comes later. Um, if you want, for those of you who are thinking of complaining to the administration, this is just a thought experiment. No dolphins were actually harmed in the preparation of this lecture, <laughs> to my knowledge. I claim these two are essentially the same event. If I'm choosing k dolphins to save, and the other n minus k are dying, that's the same as choosing n minus k dolphins to be killed, and the remaining k live. So choosing k1s to save is the same as choosing n minus k to die. It's just a matter of which perspective do you take and how it's viewed. All right? Let's do another binomial identity. And this is a famous one. This is one from Pascal's triangle. n plus 1 choose k plus 1 is n choose k plus n choose k plus 1. Can somebody give me an awesome school? Williams. Williams. So I have n students from Williams. I need an institution that sucks. Amherst. Amherst. I have one person from Amherst. And I want to choose k plus 1 people. And I don't care about ordering. I just want to choose k plus 1 people. How many total people are there? How many people do we have in total? n plus 1 people. How many ways can we choose k plus 1 people from n plus 1 people? How many ways can we choose it? Well, no, 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 I'll get that in a second. How, how many ways can I choose k plus 1 people from n plus 1 people? n plus 1, choose k plus 1. Essentially, by definition, <coughs> one of the easiest things to do in mathematics. Now, what were you going to say? Either the first person is in the group or they're not in the group. Right. So now we're going to solve this two different ways. This is another key technique in combinatorics. Calculate the answer two different ways. And those two different ways have to be the same. So case one, this is the good case. No one 
Fermi Amherst is polluting our group. How many ways are there to choose k plus 1 people if we don't have the person from Amherst? And choose k plus 1. Case 2, this is the bad case. Have Amherst. How many ways are there to do that? And choose k. I've already got the person from Amherst. I need k more people. Therefore, <coughs> n plus 1 choose k plus 1 must be n choose k plus 1 plus n choose k. And there's our answer. So this is a great way to solve the problem. I don't particularly like writing the expression like this. From a computational perspective, this is exactly how we would write the formula. I am a huge fan, as you've seen, of additional notation, cluttering things up. The reason I want to clutter things up is the more stuff you put in, the less likely you are to make a mistake. I want to view the problem another way. So let's look at an expanded calculation. So expanded calculation. n plus 1 choose k plus 1. Case 1, there's the Amherst person. I don't take the Amherst person. There's one choose zero ways of choosing no one from Amherst. That's going to turn out to be 1. And now, of the n Williams students, how many do I take? k plus 1. Or I could take that Amherst student. Well, there's one Amherst person. I've got to take them. It's 1 choose 1. And now, of the remaining, you know, there's n Williams students, how many of them do I need? I need k. <coughs> and if you notice, the, the tops sum to n plus 1. And what do the bottoms sum to? The bottoms sum to k plus 1. And so this is a really good way to make sure how we included everything. When I look at the other way, n plus 1 choose k plus 1 is n choose k plus 1 plus n choose k, the tops and the bottoms are not summing to the same thing. There looks like an asymmetry. This, in some sense, has restored balance between the two different expressions. And now we can essentially see why they would combine together like this. This is looking at basically splitting up the n plus 1. You can tell a lot of stories along these lines. And so I'm not going to do too much more on this right now, but there's a whole slew of problems you could do. Here's a nice one. Try to come up with the sum k goes from 0 to n of n choose k squared, which is the same as the sum k goes from 0 to n of n choose k, n choose n minus k. And it turns out there's a really nice answer for this, star over star. There's a very simple expression for what that sum is. If you can figure out what is the right story to tell. So I'll leave that as something for you to think about. Okay. This is a very hard method. This is very different than just the plug and chug calculations. You've got to figure out what is the right story to tell. Okay. Any questions so far about what we've done? Everybody's comfortable with these basic combinatorics. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to shift a little bit to poker hands. There is a huge amount of stuff we can do with poker hands. You know, whether or not there's wild cards, whether or not uh, flop cards, you know, what kind of hands are you doing, high, low, lots of different things. This is not a class on poker. Okay? I've done a lot of calculations in the book. You know, by all means, you know, I'm, I encourage you to read them. In some of the ones, I've calculated things multiple ways. And what I want to do now is I want to just go over one poker calculation, which I think is representative of the types of problems you would want to do. And again, you know, I urge you, look at the other ones, make sure you can do calculations like this. Just so that we're all on the same page, a standard deck of cards has 52 cards. There are four suits, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. The cards go 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, jack, queen, king, ace. 
Frequently Ace is allowed to be high or low. I am not looking at trick decks. Okay, if you have trick decks, you know, things are a little bit different. Uh, I have a deck at home, which is all, I think, three of clubs. You know, I can guess your card no matter what you do, but I can only run the trick once. All right, we will assume you have a standard deck of cards. Typically, you assume the cards are shuffled and that the cards are dealt out independently of each other. That if you have one card, it does not affect your likelihood of getting any other card. This is not true if the deck is not shuffled. Anybody know what a deck, when it's not shuffled, looks like? <coughs> you have all four suits, all in order. I think it starts with ace and goes up to king. I'm not positive it's, it's been a while, but the cards are not mixed. Great, great mathematics has been done about how many shuffles and what type of shuffles do you need before you can assume a deck is essentially mixed. We will assume this is the mathematically ideal deck. Any bridge players here? I think the answer is no. The slight differences between how humans shuffle and how computers completely randomize. And the distribution of certain cards is a little bit different in computer-generated shuffles than in hand-generated uh, shuffles. All right, so here is one of the questions. No. So this will be poker. Five cards. <coughs> what is the probability of a full house? That means three of one number, two of another. Now what's nice about this problem is I don't have to worry too much. If I ask, what's the probability of two pairs? So a two pair is this two pairs. Is this two pairs. Yes or no? I'm sorry? In poker, this would be higher. You would consider this a full house. Could I also say I have two pairs here? Yeah. Yes. Um, what about this? Does that count as two pairs? It depends, it depends on how you define things. We don't really want to be getting into things like this. But it's extremely important that whenever you're doing these problems, you are very clear about what are you counting. Do you count this as two pairs? Do you count this as two pairs? We classify this as a full house, but technically, do I have two of one number and two of another number? Yes. And so for a lot of problems like this, you've got to be extremely careful to make sure you're answering the right question. If you're ever not sure, what should you do? I'm sorry? That won't help. <coughs> One thing is look it up, ask somebody. Because the whole question here is, does this count or not? Uh, somebody was telling me, I won't mention their name, that they were in England a few years ago, and they had a bet on whether or not a basketball game would end in a tie. And they were very confident in making this bet because basketball games can't end in a tie. Except what they didn't realize is, the way they were doing the bets, they meant the game ends in a tie in regulation, which can't happen, and the person actually lost. And so he was looking at the way the arbitrage was following, he would actually be guaranteed to make money. You've got to be very careful that you know how things are defined. Okay? So in this situation, if I want to know what is the probability that we have a full house, this is much easier because you know, if I have five cards, there's only one way to do it. I have three of one and two of the other. I don't have to worry about any of those cases. All right, so what I want to do is I want to count the number of hands that are full houses, and I'll divide by the number of hands of five cards. One of the big issues here is to make sure I don't mix and match. So here, if I'm going to look at ordered hands in the top, I have to look at ordered hands in the bottom. If I'm going to look at unordered hands in the top, I look at unordered hands down below. In a problem like this, do you want to have ordered or unordered hands? Do you care about the order in which you are dealt the cards, or do you just care about what cards you have? <coughs> I just care about what cards I have. All right, so the bottom, is pretty easy. How many ways are there 
to form a hand of five cards from 52. 52 choose five. So this is essentially the definition. Now, I can try to go through how many different hands are there with full houses. There's a lot of different ways of doing the calculation here. One thing I could do is I could specify the two numbers. Maybe I have aces and fives. And I can count how many ways are there to have aces and fives. But even if I choose aces and fives, do I still need more information? What information do I need? The number of each. Is it three aces and two fives? Or two aces and three fives? And then, once I do this for aces and fives, I have to do it for aces and fours, aces and threes, aces and twos. I've got to do it for all the things with aces, and then all the things, and I have to go through all the different possibilities. So there's lots of different ways. So the number of full houses. One possibility is I've got to choose two numbers. You know, these are the numbers that I'm going to have three times and two times. How many ways are there to choose those two different numbers? 13 choose two. Now, I have to choose which one do I get three times and which one do I get twice. How many ways are there to choose which one I get three times? Two choose one. If I wanted to, I could put in a one choose one. For now, I have one remaining one. So this is number of ways to choose two numbers. This is number of ways to choose which is three times. All right. So at this point, I've now chosen my two numbers. Maybe it's aces and fives. And I've chosen that it's the aces that's going to happen three times. How many ways are there to get three aces? Four, choose three. I have four aces. I have to choose three of them. So this is number of ways to choose three of four of a number. And now what's the last thing I have to put in? Four, choose two. And this will be number of ways <coughs> to choose two. And so all I have to do now is I just have to calculate this number, and I divide by 52, choose five, and that's the answer. The hardest part is remembering that we have this 2 choose 1. And if we forget this 2 choose 1, our answer is going to be half of what it should be. Yes? Is it that different that first expression has been then calling that whole thing um, 13 P2? Okay, so if I chose this as 13 P2, that would actually be the same. So here, that's an excellent observation. What you're remarking is that 13 choose 2 times 2 choose 1 is actually 13 P2. I'm choosing 2 from 13 where order matters. And so what's going on here is I have 13 factorial over 2 factorial, 11 factorial, times 2 factorial over 1 factorial, 1 factorial. The 2's cancel. And amazingly, this is now 13 factorial over 11 factorial, which is 13 P2. There's lots of different ways of getting to the same point. And so one thing is to say, I'm going to choose two numbers in order, and it's going to matter. Another way of doing the calculation is I choose the number that occurs three times. There's 13 choose one ways of doing that. How many ways are there now to choose three cards from those four? Four choose three. Now I have 12 numbers remaining. I choose one of the 12. And now it's 4 choose 2. Multiplication is commutative. You know, we saw this when we were looking at, you know, is it better to have the shirt marked up and then marked down, or marked down and then marked up? If the movements are the same, it doesn't matter the order in which it's done, although the store can easily confuse you by marking it up and then marking it down to make you feel like a discount has happened. I can write the numbers in this order. It's the same expression. Okay? This problem is perfectly suited for numerical exploration. This is where you want to be able to write a simple computer code and just generate a large number <coughs> of hands. 
And if you can generate enough hands, you can then start to sniff out, do we think that this is right with the two choose one or without the two choose one? It's very easy to forget or to put an extra ordering. If you can do the, some numerics, you have a chance of seeing the answer. It's important whenever you're doing any computer exploration that you be in the regime where you can observe enough events so that the computer will give you a reasonable approximation to the true answer. So I've done the numerical simulations. I think it was about 0.14% of the time you get a full house. This is enough so that if I do it a million times, I'm reasonably confident I'm going to be getting a good answer. Later in the book, we talk about perfect deals, where exactly one person is dealt all cards of one suit to maybe multiple people are dealt all cards in a perfect suit. How likely is it for multiple people to have all cards in one suit? <coughs> very, very unlikely. The odds of just one person having all cards in a suit is astronomically small. When you factor in two, three, or four also having them, it's so small that the probability doesn't significantly increase or decrease. When you're going from exactly one to at least one, it doesn't really matter. If you were to try to do the numerical exploration, I think the probability is like 1 in 10 to the 11 of you know, at least one person. A computer, maybe you can do around 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 calculations easily on your PC. You're not going to be able to see the probability well enough to detect the difference between at least one person and exactly one person being a one-suited hand. So when you're doing numerical explorations, you've got to be careful. Okay. Fortunately, the probability here is high enough that we're okay. All right. So what I want to end with is the binomial theorem and Pascal's triangle. All right. So binomial theorem and Pascal's triangle. All right. So hopefully you've seen this before. One, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one, one, five. 10, 10, 5, 1, and so on. We basically have all 1's on the outside, and any number on the inside is the sum of the 2 above. If you think about this, this is exactly the recurrence relation we just talked about. n plus 1 choose k plus 1 is n choose k plus n choose k plus 1. The recurrence relation we mentioned for the binomial coefficients, this is exactly how we generate the stuff in Pascal's triangle. This corresponds to x plus y to the 0, x plus y to the 1, x plus y squared, x plus y cubed, x plus y to the 4th. And what I mean is if you expand out x plus y squared, you get x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. If you expand out x plus y cubed, you get x cubed plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. <laughs> these are the coefficients you get when you expand out these numbers. So there's a lot of stuff in the appendix proving the binomial theorem. This is going to be extremely useful for us. In calculus, this is one of the key ingredients that allowed us to calculate the derivative of x to the n. If n is a positive integer, we use these numbers. Okay. So hopefully you've seen Pascal's triangle before. There are connections to the binomial coefficients. Okay? There's a lot of fun stuff you can do with Pascal's triangle. All right. And so I want to just do a little bit of fun stuff. All right. And now my feeling is that it is probably not going to show up uh, for the people who are watching on video. So what those people will have to do is just go home and you know, watch the Mathematica file, the notebook. I've actually posted this on YouTube. Okay, so I've got to move this over. Just a little bit further. Yeah, it's not going to work. All right. So when you look at Pascal's triangle, there's a lot of great mathematics here. Okay. Most of it's now hidden by the blackboard, by the projector, but oh well. What you can do is you can look at the rows of Pascal's triangle, and you can look at each entry mod 2. So if it's even, let's delete it. If it's odd, let's put in a dot. And so what I'm doing here is you should be able to see this three dots. For those of you at home, I apologize. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add more and more rows. And instead of putting Pascal's triangle going down like this, I'm actually rotating Pascal's triangle 90 degrees. And what's going to happen is I'm going to keep adding more and more rows to the right. 
and I'm going to constantly renormalize my triangle so it always fills up the same box. I'm going to normalize it so whatever number of rows I have, I'm rescaling it so the last row is at 1. Okay. If you haven't seen this before, I'm hoping you will find that this is cool. All right, so I'm using the manipulate in Mathematica, and I'm going to go slowly and start adding more and more rows. And again, it's a filled in dot if the number is odd mod 2. Hopefully you can begin to see a pattern starting to emerge. Uh, I've already done the calculations at home so that it is printing it out faster. We talked about the factorial function at the beginning of the day and recursion. This is a great example of recursion right now. So I will pause it uh, momentarily. <coughs> and what you can see over here is this piece over here is repeated here and here. This block is then repeated here and here. This block is then repeated here and here. I guess I didn't pause it. It's just going so slowly because there's so much to compute. So if you've seen stuff like this before, this is the Sapinski triangle. It's a <coughs> fractal shape that's emerging. There is an incredible amount of structure. In terms of what's going on, to actually calculate these binomial coefficients, it is a real pain. These numbers get very, very large. But from a computational perspective, and this is one of the things I want you to get out of the course, we don't have to compute the numbers. When I'm drawing this, do I actually care about what these values are? Do I care at all? I care if they're even or odd. So one thing I can do is I can just save is the previous row of the entries even or odd. And if I do that, well then all I have to do is then use my rules to then figure out even plus even is even, even plus odd is odd, odd plus odd is even, and I can use that to figure out what happens next. So in terms of just you know, going forward a little bit, you know, go forward maybe into the thousands, and you know, the more iterations you do this, the more structure, the more things <coughs> you can begin to see emerging. So then the question becomes, how would we calculate stuff like this efficiently? Well, one thing is, if we know a specific row, we can then use that to get the next row. But in some sense, that means we have to go through things in order. We will see these binomial coefficients throughout the whole semester in terms of importance. I don't want to have to compute everything. In Wednesday's lecture, we're going to talk about bypassing a lot of computations and just jumping to answers. And so one of the things I want to end with is n choose k. This is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. So we want to compute well. Is n choose 0 easy or hard to compute? Easy. n choose 0 is just 1. n choose 1 is 1. n choose 2 is n, n minus 1 over 2. Okay, it's beginning to get a little bit more involved. We can compute things in terms of the previous values. n choose k plus 1 is n factorial over k plus 1 factorial n minus k plus 1 factorial. And again, one of the reasons I want to do this is I want to emphasize parentheses. I want to emphasize how to do algebra. This looks a lot like this. I've got a k plus 1 factorial. I want a k factorial. Let me pull out a k plus 1. Over here, I'm going n minus k minus 1. I only want to go to n minus k. So what I want to do is I want to multiply by n minus k over n minus k. And now this will be the same as the n minus k factorial. In fact, I don't need parentheses here. And what I get is the following. The next binomial coefficient is a really nice multiple of the previous. And when you do something like this, you can keep the multiplication nice. When I have this expression, do I want to multiply by the numerator first and then divide by the denominator, or divide by the denominator and then multiply by the numerator? And it does matter. Which do I want to do first? Nope. Want to multiply by the numerator. What kind of number is the, are the binomial coefficients? They're integers. If I divide by k plus 1, I might leave integerdom. I'll then return when I multiply by n minus k, but I could have numerical issues, rounding issues with my computer. If I multiply first by n minus k, I'm guaranteed to have something that's a multiple of k plus 1. So order matters. Multiply, then divide. OK, so again, the whole point of this is to give you a sense of efficiency and doing computations well. We will talk more about this when we do mathematical modeling 
tomorrow. I'd feel free to grab M&Ms. If you haven't picked up homework, please do so. And then have a great rest of the day.